So we are live in five, four, three, two, one. We are live now. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the platform of Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation India. Today we have our chairman, Dr. John Mukhopadhyay, sir, who is teaching us about osteotomies around hip. Uh, today, uh, sir, is discussing about osteotomies uh, on the acetabular side. So, uh, over to you, sir. Uh, thanks, uh, Jan. Uh, Welcome to this webinar. I'm going to talk about the topic for today's osteotomies around the hip. And uh, I think uh, this is an important area, both in pediatric and adult orthopedics. Uh, this is osteotomies are a common surgical procedure in various parts of the body. And there are various implications, uh, especially around the hip. And uh, they can be beneficial in many ways. Uh, it can be used to improve the coverage of the femoral head. It could be used to healing, help in healing fractures. This we heard about last week from Dr. Sadhu about the valgus osteotomy for non-unions of fracture neck femur. Uh, it can be used for improving stability. This is uh, uh, osteotomy such as the shams or a pelvic support osteotomy. You can reduce pain depending on where the stress or the weight pairing is concentrated on. And these are some of the principles which Bombelli has described uh, very well. And of course, in preventing or delaying arthroplasty, especially in a young patient, where you want to try and delay uh, the need for a hip joint replacement or uh, even in other parts of the body. So for the hip, you can have osteotomies either above the hip on the pelvic side or below the hip on the femoral side. And uh, interestingly, the first known osteotomy was performed by John Rhea Burton, who was a, who was a surgeon in Pennsylvania. And he used this uh, to uh, straighten a fixed, adducted, flexed, uh, internally rotated hip. He did a subtrochanteric osteotomy and uh, brought the femur in line with, uh, with what it should be in terms of uh, the uh, alignment and then use that to become, a, uh, to work as a bit of plasty through which he could move his joint. Of course, this doesn't always work and uh, when, when this uh, unites, then it would uh, still be a useful uh, procedure for this patient who has such a deformity. Uh, Although we are not going to cover femoral osteotomies today, I'll just go to a brief uh, sort of uh, look at how we uh, classify them. And that could be according to the level where the osteotomy is, starting from below, uh, going more proximally. You have subtrochanteric osteotomies, you have intertrochanteric osteotomies, they could be at the basal neck or subcapital osteotomies. And today we even have. Uh, femoral head osteotomies, such as the femoral head reduction osteotomy, depending on the need for uh, the osteotomy in a particular pathology. Uh, the other way of classifying the proximal femoral osteotomies would be according to the function they serve. Uh, this could be for containment, uh, like in a varus osteotomy, which you may do for a perthes or a, a sort of CDH. You may, we talked about fracture healing last week, reducing pain to correct deformity or to instability. Uh, coming to acetabular osteotomies, I think uh, one must recognize they broadly fall into two groups. Uh, first is the redirectional osteotomy, and this could be the Salter's osteotomy, uh, uh, the triple osteotomy. Uh, uh, Pythonis, etc., and the Gans osteotomy, which is a very acetabular osteotomy. Okay, uh, you have the reshaping osteotomies such as the Pemberton and the Dega, and then you have the salvage procedures such as the shelf procedure and the Chiari procedure, where you have a hip that is not congruent anymore, but you want to get coverage for some time, 
uh, because the patients are young, you don't want to go straight to a total leg replacement. Now, when we talk about redirectional osteotomies, there are different osteotomies for that. You have the Salter's or Salter osteotomy, which is a single bone osteotomy, where only one bone ileum is cut. You have the double osteotomy described by Sunderland, not used very much today, but uh, was popular for some time. And this is an osteotomy where you uh, divide the uh, ileum and the pubis, and we'll discuss it later. And then you have the triple osteotomy where all three bones, that is the, uh, the ileum, the pubis, and the ischium are cut to redirect the acetabulum. Okay, so starting with the first and the most commonly used osteotomy for pediatric hips, uh, certainly for a long time, is the Salter osteotomy. And this was classically described for the development dysplasia or the CDH as it was called in those days. And this classic paper by Salter on the inanimate osteotomy in the treatment of dislocation and subluxation of the hip joint in the JBJS 1961 is where uh, one first uh, learned about it. Okay, uh, This can also be used for Perthes osteotomy. So although most people uh, still do the osteotomy on the femoral side for Perthes, uh, Salters, Thompson's, etc. felt that doing the osteotomy on the acetabular side was probably more useful because you did not uh, risk shortening the limb when you did that. And there are also another, uh, so basically the Salter osteotomy is a redirectional osteotomy. So you change the direction of the acetabulum to improve the coverage of the hip. Okay, so, and basically this covers the anterior and lateral coverage. It's ideally between the ages of 18 months to seven years of age, uh, because you have to uh, hinge it on the pubic symphysis. Okay, so ideally the uh, symphysis pubis and the triradiate cartilage should still be open. You, uh, one of the prerequisites for the Salter osteotomy is that the hip should be, should have congruent joint surfaces. So if you have a misshapen hip, then this is not ideal for uh, the Salter osteotomy. There are other pathologies where you can use it for, such as paralytic hip dislocations. Again, in uh, things like CP, where you reduce a hip, you may have to also improve the coverage. Uh, sequelae of septic arthritis, and in certain conditions where you end up with a fixed pelvic obliquity. Now, how does the Salter osteotomy work? I think it's by uh, the osteotomy goes from the anterior inferior superior, uh, anterior inferior iliac spine to the sciatic notch. Okay, now. Uh, it is used through a, done through an iliofemoral approach. Uh, class today, mostly uh, we use a transverse incision just below the iliac crest, and uh, you need to strip the inner and outer table after dividing the uh, cartilaginous part of the iliac apophysis. Okay, so once you've done that, you strip the inner muscles on the inner table as well as on the outer table down to the hip joint, okay? Uh, and you have to go all the way from the uh, anterior part of the ileum to the sciatic notch because the osteotomy has to go right through. You first do your open reduction of the hip. That means you identify the uh, reflected head of the rectus femoris. You divide that. Then you go to the straight head at the anterior inferior spine. You tag that and divide it, and then you come on to the capsule of the hip joint, uh, the, which you need to uh, divide in a T-shape uh, along the margin of the stablum and then along the neck, which is used to then brief the capsule once you've done your reduction. And you need to release the psoas tendon at the brim or just outside the brim so that all the tight fibers in that area are, are uh, sort of release. And then you need to come down to the acetabulum. Uh, at one time, people would excise the uh, labrum, but today uh, we tend to release the labrum and evert it because it's an inverted labrum. And if you evert it, it gives you a better coverage of the head. You need to get down to the acetabulum, clean it up of any 
tissue that may be there. The transverse acetabular ligament may be a sort of uh, a obstruction to your reduction. So you need to get a good concentric reduction of the hip, then reef the capsule over it. And then if you need coverage, you do the salt osteotomy. So the cut is from the anterior inferior iliac spine to the sciatic notch. And once you've completed the cut, and classically we do that with a jelly saw, or you can use a combination of uh, a, a saw and an osteotome, but the jelly saw is the safest one, which you pass through the sciatic notch and come towards the anterior superior, anterior inferior iliac spine. And then once you cut it, you as you rotate the limb into a figure of four position, the uh, acetabulum, acetabulum hinges on the symphysis uh, pubis and rotates to give you better anterior and inferior coverage. You end up having a gap on the anterior part, which you take a, a, a bone graft from the iliac crest and put it into that and then fix it with k -wise going across from the ileum through the graft onto the posterior part uh, behind the uh, acetabulum. So in the model, this is uh, courtesy Dr. James Rui, uh, where you can see the 3D reconstructed model. This is where your osteotomy would be from the sciatic notch to the anterior inferior spine. And then uh, you would take a graft. Once you've done your correction, you take the graft from here uh, you impact the graft here and then you put this K wire through this part of the ileum into the graft, into this part of the bone towards the posterior part of the acetabulum. You have to be careful not to penetrate the acetabulum. Okay, so once you've done this, then you uh, cut these wires just under the skin and you have to put the patient in a spica, uh, that which you uh, and the wires are removed. Uh, at a later date when you are removing the hip spica for the child. Okay, so that is the basic uh, steps of the Salter osteotomy. Here's a classical example. This is a three year, six month old girl with a untreated uh, development uh, dislocation. They are displaced of the hip with dislocation. And you can see the very vertical uh, line of the acetabular roof, okay? So what you would need to do is do an open reduction and then you need to do an osteotomy to get this down to give you a good coverage. So that's what we have done. Now you can see how nicely the acetabular is covered. These are the two kevas which are bent just under the skin so that they can be removed easily later. And this is a follow-up at 10 months and then again at 18 months and this is a, at four years post-operatively. And again, you can see even at 18 months how nicely the hip is covered. Okay, now uh, the advantages of the Salter osteotomy is that it corrects any ab uh, abnormal direction of the uh, acetabulum. It provides immediate stability of the reduction because of the graft, although you uh, have to put in k wires here just to be sure that nothing slips. It does not alter the congruity of the acetabulum. So the shape of the acetabulum remains the same. It's just redirected. And the articular cartilage of the femoral head and acetabulum is in contact in the functional position of weight bearing. Okay, so that is what the advantages of the Salter osteotomy are. Okay, also the femoral head is better covered by the acetabulum, preventing degenerative changes and stability permits early resumption of function. You also gain some limb length because a lot of these patients have some shortening. Secondly, if you have to do a femoral paras rotation osteotomy, which in the older child, you often have to combine it with uh, the osteotomy on the pelvic side, gives you some gain in the limb length, which you're losing on the femoral side. Okay. Now, of course, there are complications. You can get re-dislocation. Remember, it doesn't give you such a good posterior coverage. And some pathologies is the pos posterior coverage that is more deficient. And there, this will not be as useful. And of course, you can get vascular necrosis as in almost any operation around there. <clears throat> so in, uh, I think 1977, this paper came out from Sunderland, from San Diego, which is where they felt that by doing an osteotomy of the pubis as well, you got a much better rotation of the fragment. Okay, so 
what they did was the initial part was just like the Salter's osteotomy. So you cut through there and then you would made an uh, osteotomy of the pubis just medial to the obturator foramen. So the advantage was that you did not enter the obturator foramen, yet you were lateral to the midline structures which are important. So you did not risk damaging the vessels and nerve which go more laterally. And you, you were able to rotate this fragment much better. You had to put in grafts here as, you, as in the uh, uh, salt osteotomy while you fix this in the position with KYS again, which had to be removed later. Okay, So this gives you a better coverage and a better rotation than would be a simple salt osteotomy. But uh, it's somehow not been so popular because it's technically a little more difficult uh, than the Salter's osteotomy. And today you have other osteotomies such as the acetabular reshaping osteotomies, which allow you to do uh, most of the functions that uh, a Sunderland which give you an advantage to a Salter's. Okay, so you have this uh, group of osteotomies called the acetabular reshaping osteotomies. And the uh, first one is the Pemberton osteotomy, which was, uh, we'll describe it in a moment. And then you have uh, uh, the Dega osteotomy and certain modifications of it, such as the San Diego osteotomy, which are a group of uh, operations which can come under the uh, sort of be called lateral acetabuloplasties. Okay, so uh, the first is the Pemberton osteotomy. Here, what is different, again, the approach, etc., are very similar. But the cut is from anterior to posterior, but not all the way into the sciatic notch. So you actually curve the osteotomy down a bit posteriorly, and then you hinge open the anterior part. You don't completely divide the inner table, although it is divided to some extent. And then you hinge it, and then you put the graft into this anterior part there. Okay, So that is the area. This is sort of hinged down to cover the anterior part, and then... The graft is jammed in here to keep that uh, uh, sort of rotated fragment down. Okay, And this gives you a better coverage of the anterior part. Uh, also reduces the size of the acetabulum. So if you have a capacious acetabulum, which is bigger than the femoral head, it helps you reduce the size of, size of the acetabulum. So again, in a bone model, this is what it looks like. Here's your osteotomy which curves back as you can see here and then this is this is acetabulum here this is the osteotomy which is incomplete at the back and then you put in the bone graft here which gives you a much better coverage of the femoral head in the acetabulum okay so um, now uh, the lateral acetabular plasties starting with the uh, Dega and then the San Diego modification is uh, different. Again, uh, you have to first get a concentric reduction of the femoral head and then you need to have an open triradiate cartilage, preferably. Okay, So the ileum is exposed as for the salters. So uh, on the outer table, you have to go right down to the hip joint to reduce the hip. You don't have to go all the way. You don't have to strip the an inner table all the way down to where you are doing the osteotomy. And then you do the osteotomy about an inch uh, and uh, above the acetabulum. You first go with a straight osteotomy and cut across. Okay, so uh, sort of a centimeter or more above it. We tend to go a little higher so that we get better bone because otherwise this bone is not very, uh, sometimes collapses on you. You go first with a straight osteotome and then you curve your osteotomy down and then hinge it open. You take grafts from again the same part of the anterior uh, uh, portion of the iliac crest, divide it into three bits and then uh, jam it into the gap. So here, as you bring it down, you put in the grafts into this area and you can plan your graft depending on which part of the acetabulum you want more coverage on. So you can use a larger graft in the front if you need more anterior coverage or a larger graft in the back if you need better posterior coverage. So that's how you do it. These are the grafts you put in, these triangular bone grafts. And usually the 
in the CDS because the anterior coverage becomes the part of the largest graft is anterior. The other advantage of this is because this is quite stable because you haven't cut through the inner table, the you don't need to put wires to hold it. Okay, so that's a good, big advantage of this procedure. So you don't have to then take out the wires. Now, how does the San Diego differ from the Vega? So in the Vega, you don't go all the way to the uh, shatic notch, while in the San Diego, you go all the way to the shatic notch. So the Vega has better anterior coverage, not so good posterior coverage as compared to the San Diego. Okay, So here, a bit is left, while in the San Diego, you go all the way. So here you can see you're stopping short of the shatic notch. You're getting better anterior coverage than posterior coverage. Okay, so how it, it, it is, uh, differs is that San Diego goes all the way here. The Pemberton goes down till here. And then you also have another version, the Pembersol. And we'll just talk a little bit about it, which goes down here all the way to the triradiate cartilage. Okay, so... Uh, so the advantages of these uh, osteotomies, which are grouped into this uh, acetabuloplasties, is they are inherent stable, inherently stable. So you don't need a fixation. It addresses the capaciousness of the uh, acetabulum as well as the malorientation. You don't get posterior uncovering like you might get in the salters, uh, and you also get anterior and lateral coverage. And it's versatile in that you can change where you put the graft depending on where you want more coverage. Okay, so that's the advantage of it. So uh, this is a patient uh, we did recently uh, with the arthrogypotic and multiple problems. We had to operate on his knees, which were dislocated. Uh, we had bilateral rigid club feet, which we had to treat. And then now he's about almost three years old and the hips are two and a half years old and the hips are way up and we decided to now do the uh, correction here. So we had to do an open reduction, we had to do a shortening Paris osteotomy of the proximal uh, femur and we did an open reduction. You can see now the head is nicely concentric and we've done a sort of San Diego or Diego type of osteotomy to pull down this graft over this area and then fill this with bone graft. Okay, So you can see how Nicely, the head is covered all the way till here. This is the immediate post-op X-ray. Unfortunately, with the spike card, it doesn't show so well, but you've got head coverage all the way to here. You can see the triradiate cartilage and the head is nicely concentrically reduced into the acetabulum. So then you have uh, what we call is the Pembersol osteotomy. And this was uh, almost something which was discovered by mistake. Someone was trying to do a Pemberton osteotomy, but ended up cutting all the way down into actually the notch here uh, and the triradiate cartilage. And uh, just once it happened, they continued with the procedure and found that it was much easier to get a good coverage in this than with a simple Pemberton osteotomy. And there are modifications of this. This is the Paley modification. Again, you can see here, the osteotomy goes all the way to the triradiate cartilage. And then again, you do it the same way you put in the bone grafts uh, as you want to, to cover the areas of the uh, acetabulum, which are deficient, okay? So this is known as the Pembersol osteotomy, which was a bit, uh, what we call a serendipitous uh, development, uh, which happened when someone by mistake got too far with the Pemberton osteotomy and then used it to improve the coverage he got for the head with his osteotomy. Okay, so that is covers the reshaping osteotomies and the single and double osteotomy. So we now come to the triple inanimate osteotomies. And this for the older child or the or young adults where uh, once the triradiate cartilage is uh, beginning to fuse and the pubic symphysis is no longer uh, possible to hinge on, you have to think of different ways to redirect your acetabulum. And this is a redirectional pelvic osteotomy where you have to divide all three parts of the you know, uh, sort of pelvic bone, which is the innominate, the pubis, and the ischium. 
Okay. And the idea is that you want to get better coverage of the hip to delay the onset of osteoarthritis. So ideally, it should be done before you have significant osteoarthritic changes. Otherwise, it's unlikely to be successful. And again, it was the triple enominate was first described by Lacour and then Hoff in 1966. This was modified by Steele and Tonis in 73 and 78. And these were the two osteotomies. Uh, especially the steel, which became very popular. Uh, the difference between the steel and the tonus is that the tonus it has an oblique ischial cut closer to the acetabulum above the ischiosacral ligaments. So it gives you a slightly better acetabular rotation. Okay, now these are uh, photographs courtesy Dr. Alaric, Alagis, where the ischial cut has been done in a prone position with an incision there. Uh, it's important to confirm your ischial cut because it's a thick bone, uh, lots of ligaments. So you want to make sure it's mobile. So there is used a laminar spreader to check that his cut is complete before proceeding to the other parts of the surgery. Now, when you do it this way, unfortunately, you have to redrape the patient for the second part of the osteotomy or your other two cuts. So another way of doing it is to keep, keep the patient supine and then flex the hip up all the way to about 60 to 70 degrees and then you make your cut in the over the ischium and do your osteotomy. Uh, you have to be careful that the, there is no soiling from the anal area when you're doing this. Okay, And then you go out and do your pubic cut and your uh, ileal cut. You can use the uh, anterior ileoinguinal approach for this or if you want you can use two separate approaches including uh, so using a uh, sort of uh, panel stain incision for your pubic cut and a iliofemoral approach for your uh, uh, ischial, uh, for your ileal cut okay now here you want to avoid the figure of eight position uh, you need to pay attention to the transverse place rotation and avoid too much anterior rotation because here you have that and usually use a shank screw to try and get the head rotated into uh, a correct position. Try to avoid uh, over or under correction. So aim for a, a center edge angle of about 30 to 35 degrees. Okay, and then you have to fix it with wires or screws now. Uh, this is a child again, which we operated on recently. We're doing an open reduction for a CDH many years ago. He was okay till about a year and a half after surgery. This was the extra at that time. Then by the, another three years, you can see the head is drifting. And it was a time we suggested, it was about five and a half or six then, we suggested that we should have a, a Salter osteotomy. But that time, uh, he was asymptomatic. So they delayed. And then you had the COVID uh, sort of pandemic. So that's delayed another two or three years. And he came to us recently at the age of almost 11 with this position. So... We debated whether we would be better off doing a Chiari or we did a triple osteotomy, something like a, a triple or a GANS, whatever. So we decided on a triple osteotomy uh, and uh, this is what we achieved. So you're able to get the hip into the stabler and get a reasonably good stabler coverage. Uh, and the osteotomies were, that was where we did the pubic osteotomy and that's where we did the ischial osteotomy. Okay, so but, uh, eventually... Again, this is early days, so we don't know how he does it. Follow up. Uh, last, we come to the periacetabular osteotomies, which was described by Gans uh, in birth, also known as the Bernese osteotomy. And the main idea of this is to bring these osteotomies closer to the acetabular. Okay? So the advantage of this is you reduce any secondary deformities, you reduce problems with soft tissues, and improve the ability to correct. Okay? So... The periacetabular osteotomy goes very close to the acetabulum on all the sides. And then you correct it and you fix it with these screws, which gives you a very stable <laughs> fixation. Uh, the, this is done in older uh, sort of adolescents or in young adults. Okay, So the approach can be either through uh, modified smith peterson approach or an anterior uh, ilioinguinal approach. What's different in this is that you 
do a stripping of the inner side of the acetabulum. Try to avoid stripping all the abductors <coughs> so that you're not affecting the power of the abductor. Now, the sequence is you start with the ischium again, like I said, we do it in the supine position with the hip flex to 60 to 70 degrees. You go between the medial capsule and the obturator externus. <coughs> you need to have these special osteotomes notched, which you can cut just below the acetabulum here. So you put quite high, just below the acetabulum, and you cut through the ischium, and you don't go all the way. You just leave a little bit of the bone there, okay? Then you do the pubis. Again, pubis is done close to the acetabulum. So you have to really be careful of the femoral nerve and vessels and also the obturator nerve when you do this. Okay, so be careful about that. And this is just medial to the acetabulum. And then you do your first part of your ileal cut, which is again, uh, just above the acetabulum. You go down and then go back and then start going down towards your ischial cut, okay? So as you go down towards your ischial cut, you do the last bit of your osteotomy, which is the final ileum ischial cut, which by that time you put in a shank screw, you gradually cut. As you get close to your ischial cut, you use the shank screw to gently lever out this acetabulum and get it into position. So the last bit is more or less broken with the shank screw in place. And then you get the correction, get, you can get 20 degrees, anterior and lateral correction, avoid external rotation. If you do under correction, obviously there will be progression of the osteoarthritis. If you do too much correction, then you are going to get impingement. So these are the things to watch out for. Uh, the complications are there which you need to watch out for, things like nerve injury, joint penetration, avascular necrosis of the acetabulum. You can get non-union of your osteotomy because you're cutting all the way around. Uh, you can get stress fractures and abductor weakness, although you're trying to your best to avoid that because of all the dissection, you might get abductor weakness. So these are the things you need to watch out. Um, there are ways of uh, today, some modifications like minimally invasive techniques for this and neural monitoring. So uh, to prevent neuro neurological injury during surgery. Lastly, we come to the salvage procedures. And this is the, includes the shelf procedure and the tearing osteotomy. And this is for coverage of incongruous joints. So what you do in the shelf is you leave the, so the hip is in joint, but is incongruent, you, but, and is uncovered. You leave the hip where it is, leave the capsule intact, and then you cut off the outer table of the ileum, fold it down over this area, and then, Fill in bone grafts into this area, okay? Pack it with bone grafts. You can use a K wire or something or screw to kind of keep the position of the grafts, or you can just rely on uh, the uh, on sutures, etc., to keep it there. And this gives you better coverage, but your joint uh, is already a little arthritic, and uh, but it will help you prolong the natural life of the hip joint. And the last is the Chiari osteotomy, where you cut just above the acetabulum and actually medialize the, this is just outside the capsule, medialize the uh, inner part, the lower part, and or lateralize this part so that this gives you coverage over the head, and then you put in wires or screws to fix this. Again, as you can see, this is not really articular cartilage, but over the capsule, it forms uh, some kind of coverage for the joint to allow it to last a longer time. Okay, so these are the salvage procedures where the hip has already become incongruent or the congruency is lost uh, and you are trying to salvage the joint for some more time. So I think, uh, remember that osteotomies are among the earliest orthopedic procedures, okay, but are still very relevant today. You need to usually plan for them very carefully. It can help us to retain the natural hip joint for many years uh, before we need to go on to a joint replacement and can also help 
a sal as a salvage procedure to delay the need for a total joint arthroplasty. So thank you very much. I'll take questions now. Uh, I think uh, that's the reason I decided just to do a tablum today. We'll do the femoral part of the osteotomy at another time because otherwise it would be too much to cover and we'd be just rushing through it all. Thank yeah. you so much, sir. I think uh, most of the thing uh, in acetabular osteotomy is uh, if our TMB have any, they can ask here. Uh, meanwhile, sir, uh, about the reshaping osteotomy, uh, that what I have understood when the child is immature, means uh, when they are uh, that one. Uh, is cartilaginous, bone is cartilaginous or that uh, is it so sir or so they are still need, they, I mean you still need to be able to uh, the reshaping can only happen if the triradiate cartilage is not quite fused okay so I think beyond the age of 8 or 9 it becomes more and more difficult people do it in older children but then you probably this uh, Dega because it's incomplete, may not work. The uh, San Diego might work or one of the other osteotomies where it's complete. Okay, But as you get older, it becomes more difficult to just correct it with one osteotomy. So, uh, there is one question in the chat box by Narayan. He wants to know that will the salvage procedure provide congruency? Because you have told that it is no, so incongruent. So once the hip is incongruent, uh, you cannot provide congruency by the salvage procedure. What you are providing is coverage. Okay, because if the head is not covered, it will tend to drift further up and cause problems. So what you want is some coverage for it. It will form some kind of a pseudo capsule over that area and last for a longer time. Okay, till the child is an adult and then if you need, you can do an arthroplasty. It will also be better coverage for your arthroplasty when you need to do it. So, uh, one question from us, you want to know, in every case, there is increased acetabular index, then practically a particular osteotomy procedure. Okay, so how this works is that when you have a young child, okay, so below the age of three or you would usually get the hip joint. So we are not talking about uh, the arthrocyphotic child. We're talking about a DDH, a idiopathic uh, DDH or CDH, how we like to call it, where the hip is dislocated. Um, yes, the stabler index will be abnormal. But once you get the, the reason is that the hip joint Head is out of the acetabulum, so the acetabulum doesn't develop. Okay. Now, once you get the head congruently reduced, many of them over a period of time will gradually reduce. Now, the older you get, the less the chances of it reducing. Okay. So, as you get older, so that you decide based on once you've done your open reduction, how well the head is covered, and if there's any deficiency in the coverage, you would be uh, you would do your a stabler procedure at the same time. If you get a good coverage once you got the head in, then usually you would wait and see how the stabler develops. But if it doesn't develop, then you need to do an acetabular side procedure. Uh, in the younger child, if you find that uh, you're having to abduct the limb a lot to keep it nicely reduced, you would do a varus rotation or varus osteotomy. Okay, so if you're having to internally rotate and and abduct the hip, then it makes sense to do a varus derotation osteotomy. So you would varicize the femur and also externally rotate it so that in a neutral position, the head is nicely in. Okay, so you would do it on the femoral side. Now, as the child gets older, you would have to do both. So you would need to sometimes even shorten the femur because you don't want it to go in with a lot of pressure or tension on the head because that will increase the risk of AVM. So you may need to shorten and varicize and then do a coverage. So depending on the situation, you would do 
just to, just a reduction reduction and osteotomy on the femoral side or acetabular side or both femoral and acetabular side okay so if you can get it reduced without too much tension but you find that the head is not covered then do it on the acetabular side if you find that it's if there's too much tension when you're trying to reduce you need to shorten or derotate or varicize the femur you do that and then look at the coverage and decide if you need to do the acetabular side as well so uh, there are a few questions in the oski exam they have asked about salter osteotomy sir uh, in one of the uh, question they have asked the upper age limit and in one of the question they have asked about the age for salter osteotomy so so the age like i said in the talk is the age that most people would do it is between about a year and a half to two years to about seven to eight years okay uh, beyond that it because the you can't hinge on the pubic symphysis it becomes more difficult to get any correction with it so it would be so what is said in the article is that 7 is the oldest for bilateral and maybe you can do it to it till 8 or 9 for a unilateral is maximum but not more than that anyway above so seven, a lot of people feel that if it's bilateral you don't do anything but now people are doing it in older ages as well open reduction and the sort of thing so so even after tri radiate cartilage fusion we can do shorter osteotomy sir is it so when does the tri cartilage fusion sir about 6 years 6 to 7 6 to 7 so that's the ideal age right now there can be some variations in that okay sir. the hinging is actually around the symphysis not so much although you need an unfused uh to bring that down but the hinging is actually around the pubic symphysis which also again starts getting more fibrotic as you get older so uh, under one a little confusion what uh, we used to have sir when if we are taking the uh, the bone graft that that also contains asis sir so the attachment of asis what do we need to do something for that on the fixatory is and so the asis the that part of the bone where it's attached to is taken off is cartilage is okay so you are dividing the cartilage and splitting it on either side or you're taking it off onto one side okay we tend to split it and take the inner table in and the outer table out so the attachments of these muscles are to that okay so the bone that you're cutting doesn't have any attachment so you don't affect the Yes. So, uh, do we, uh, as you mentioned about the cherry osteotomy as a salvage procedure, so that is also asked during the DNB examination theory paper, sir. So, uh, what is the difference, sir? Because that is also a reshaping osteotomy, usually. No, no, no. There, you are not doing anything to the acetabulum. Okay. So, if you saw that, let me just get that diagram on. Can you see that? Yes, sir. Okay, so here's the stablum. A stablum ends here. Okay. Yes. So this is the stablum. So you're not cutting. That you're cutting above the stablum, and you're medializing the stablum or lateralizing this proximal part. And this is what is giving coverage to the head. And the capsule remains there. Okay, so you're not dividing the capsule in this case. You're not going into the joint at all. Okay, so it just gives you coverage. okay now over a period of time this will unite and you'll have better coverage so later on when you want to do a hip joint you you will have a better coverage for the hip joint okay but you're not actually doing anything to the you're not reshaping the osteo the acetabulum per se okay 
so uh, we can consider it as a salvage procedure so this yeah. one uh, displacement or so there's there's another there's actually a, a japanese uh, procedure called the tectoplasty which is like a extended shelf they take almost a huge part of the outer table of the iliac crest and bring it over the head for neglected cases which are left out okay or partly out so so it's like a extended shelf you take a much bigger part of the ilium and bring it over and then pack it with bone grafts so they call it the tectoplasty okay but it's not something that is used very much in the west so uh, you have mentioned in your talk sir about the uh, usually the deficiency of the acetabulum is posterior why it's so no so no i didn't say that the, the i said that this uh, deficiency may be posterior depending on the pathology okay now sorter gives you good anterior and lateral coverage which in the cdh is usually the problem but there are other pathologies where the posterior coverage like some of the cps etc where you need posterior coverage as well okay so that this is not going to work for that okay as well for that most cdh etc the anterior coverage is what you need So, so for those cases, Dega is also to me is okay, sir. For yeah, so Dega or a San Diego modification, where you can go further back, and then you can get, depending on the size of the bone graft, you can get more coverage posterior or anterior, depending on the pathology. Sir, so, uh, in the initial slides, sir, you have mentioned a uh, few slides like fish osteotomy and. Are done osteotomy. So, what are those? Uh, those come into the femoral femur part of it. Okay, that's the next time. Okay, uh, mostly for slipped up or capital epiphysis. So, uh, there are a uh, question from Dr. Subhansu. We want to know that C angle. Please elaborate. And uh, I think you have to read read that. Okay. Yes. These are things which are there in the books and uh, everywhere. I think you can't be lazy. You need to read that. Okay. Yes. Okay. And uh, sir, like, uh, what are the? Uh, although you have uh, explained about the approaches, sir, uh, the common one, uh, like Salter osteotomy. So we can do by this anterior approach, Smith Peterson. Or so it is always a anterior approach. It's a modified Smith Peterson approach. Is the uh, in the incision is what what was described by Somerville, which is a transverse incision. So you Smith Peterson has two limbs, okay, a transverse limb and a vertical limb, which goes down. Here you just go transverse slightly below the uh, uh, iliac crest, okay, a centimeter below, and so it's a transverse incision. So you don't have a scar extending down, okay. So this will be covered by the bikini for girls and things like that. Uh, just to make sure the scar is not visible uh, and prominent. And because that is along the Langer's line, it tends to heal better as well. So uh, when uh, we are doing the combined procedure with the femoral osteotomy and uh, uh, estabular side, uh, can we uh, combine both approaches into? Once a, or we have to take separate. Yeah, so you can use the full ilio femoral approach as described by Smith Peterson. Take it vertically down onto the femur, or we prefer to use two separate incisions because that way you have a gap in between. This is right on top. This is at the bottom. But you can use the full ilio femoral approach, which will lead you down to the femur. So uh, you have mentioned about the shortening in TDH cases, sir, in the femur part. Uh, if we are not able to, if we are not doing the shortening, sir, is it increases the chance of AVN? Is it so, sir? I just mentioned that, didn't I? That it depends on how much tension you are having to reduce it. Okay, if you are having to reduce it and it's very tight. Then the risk of AVN goes. If you are having to reduce it and keep it very abducted, then the risk of AVN increases. You heard of the safe zone? 
okay so you should be able to get a good concentric reduction within the safe zone even after surgery that's ideally described for closed reduction where if the hip is stable in the safe zone then you can treat it conservatively okay but even when you are doing an open reduction you should be able to get good concentric stable reduction in the safe zone you should have to abduct it if you have to abduct it too much then you should do a short if it's very tight you should uh, you need to do an osteotomy okay? to reduce the tension and so uh one question about the when to apply the hip spike and when not to apply after the procedure so i think if you're doing an open reduction almost everyone would apply a hip spike in a child okay so where you only a stabler procedure if you're doing a dega then you don't necessarily have to put a spike okay if you're just doing that part of it okay and you don't need fixation but if you're doing an open reduction along with it then of course you need a hip spike oh, sir just one more and you have to be sure that it's really stable and you have to be sure that the child is compliant because uh, if you're doing it in a young child you can never trust them to stay in bed and uh, follow what your instructions are so i'm just uh, one more question sir about when the in the child sir it is sometimes very difficult to diagnose so what procedure you used to do that if there is no ossification of the head so other than clinical sir what else we can do to find it out the confirm the cdh diagnosis. diagnosis yes sir <coughs> so screening if if it's available which unfortunately is not possible in india is what has reduced the incidence of dislocation in the western countries okay so one is clinical with Ortolani and Barlow's test. Okay, the other is ultrasound. Okay, ultrasound. You have two uh, methods. Okay, you have the uh, sort of Hockey method, which is a dynamic ultrasound where you can move the hip and look at it, and then you have the Graz method where you are looking at the angles. Okay, and that is the one which has been used most often. Okay, and if you have the right alpha and beta angles you need to observe them over a period of time if they are deficient even in a, a small child you put them in a pavlix uh, harness for some time and usually once the hip is there in that slightly abducted and flex position the acetabulum will reform okay so before the there are also some new uh, guidelines on x-rays which have been described to be able to diagnose it without the femoral head being ossified okay that you're looking at certain levels of things to be able to say if it's in the joint or not there was a recent paper on that i'm not sure i can't remember so i think uh, most of the question we have covered okay. so and the second part uh, in that one will the femoral loss to when we'll have time yeah. we can so thank you very much sir okay. maybe a couple of weeks from today yes you got something on for next week yes sir uh, sir ak pal sir i will take uh, on recent advances yes. thank you so much sir.